My name is Sister Andrea. I am actually from Cottonwood, Idaho. I am the sixth of nine children. Um, grew up on a farm, so work ethics was very much ingrained in us, as well as the need for prayer and God. Um, I have 46 nieces and nephews and one on the way, and two greats and one on the way. So as you can see, God, God has blessed our family. So God willing, there'll be more vocations in our family. Wow. Um, I've been a religious for 21 years. 16 of those years I have worked here at Bonacom House, um, caring for the priests like a mother does, and just simply being present to them and their needs. That's great. So tell me more about the Bonacom House and a little bit of the history, the history of the house, and then your history working here. How has that looked? So we opened this house in 1987 under Bishop Flavin, and I guess he had sent out a survey to the priest asking him if they thought this was a necessary thing, and they all said no. Well, he did it anyway because he saw the need for it, so thanks be to God. So in 1987, we opened it, and our sisters have staffed this house from the beginning, which has been a huge blessing, I think, for our community, but as well as for the priests for the Diocese of Lincoln. Um, so it was named after Bishop Bonacom, who's the first bishop of the Diocese of Lincoln. And Bonacom actually means with goodness. So that's kind of our motto here at the house, is to treat everybody with goodness. Um, and I think they, as I was telling Corbin earlier, they're not spoiled, they're well-loved. Because <laughs> we, do, we do everything that a mom would do. Mm. That's wonderful. And like you were telling me earlier, uh, the priests can, can be a, a father to these sisters, and the sisters can be a mother to these fathers, and I think that's a beautiful dynamic. Um, in your time, uh, either at the Bonacom House or your time in religious, uh, what have been some of the, the most memorable moments that you've had uh, either with Christ or maybe seeing Christ through the people that you work with? What, is, what has been some of those moments? Uh, to be honest, the moments are when a priest is dying. Because a priest is never more a priest than he is on his deathbed. And he's still saving souls as he's lying there giving his life for Christ. To just, for me, it's been able to accompany those priests to the threshold and then let go. Because I've been with three of them when they've died and it was just, each one was just such a beautiful experience to just, like I'm like, what, what is going on right now between God and Father, whoever is dying. And just, I mean, like one of them, I'm pretty sure he saw something and then he just let go. Mm -hmm. So just like that is one of the most beautiful things to both accompany them in life and in death. Um, obviously we love taking care of the priest, but there's something so sacred in that moment. There's something so sacred in every moment, but I think that's when I noticed it. And those were like, and I tell people I'm probably morbid, but I'm totally invigorated taking care of the sick and the dying mm -hmm. because there's so much we get from them and so much we can give to them. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, in your time here and, and in the jobs and responsibilities that you have at the house, uh, what has been some of the most rewarding experience or maybe some of the, the more fulfilling experiences that you've shared with uh, either with Christ or with others uh, what have been some of those moments? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously, those the greatest moments are in prayer. Mm -hmm. And this past summer, it was like we go on retreat every year. And this past summer, it was a game changer retreat. Like, I think I realized that, well, I knew in my head, but this year it was more um, that he's truly present. Like, he's... He's here gazing at us, and during before retreat started, I was just having this meditation about the gaze of Christ, because I was thinking, a dog can look at you, or a cat, or whatever, but only a person can truly gaze upon you. So that was like one of the greatest gifts for me personally, is just to know that he is here gazing at us. And, and then I was thinking, okay, how am I gonna see that gaze? And it's through the people I serve, through the people I encounter, and sometimes that gaze is a very sad gaze. Sometimes it's just, you never know what you're going to encounter and you never know how people are going to accept us either. Like we've had people, <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, 
I think it was in July, I was with another sister and we were at Dollar Tree or something. And this gay like marched up to us. She's like, you should be able to wear something that's cooler. That must be hot. And I'm like, no, actually, it's really not that bad. And she's like, oh. And so then I just said, it really sets us apart. And I said, how do you know a police officer is a police officer because of his uniform, right? And she's like, yeah. And then she said, she almost started crying. She said, would you, would you please pray for my son-in-law? I said, absolutely. So we prayed. And at the end of the conversation, she said, um, what are your names? And we told her. And she said, till the day I die, I will pray for both of you by name at night. And I said, okay, thank you. And she turned around to leave. And then she came back and she said, you're right. If you wouldn't have been in your habit, I wouldn't have approached you. Yeah. So I think, and also just having the visible, I kind of sidetracked, but having the visible sign that we do belong, it makes us more approachable. Mm. Because you're not just going to go up to any Joe Smo. But her gaze that day was very sad. Mm. So um, that's kind of been the theme of my life for the past <laughs> three years, is just encountering his gaze through the sacramental life, but also through others that I serve. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. She, yeah, she wouldn't have have approached you if she wasn't aware of, mm -hmm. of what you were wearing. Uh, and it's funny how it seemed like a hostile approach oh my gosh, and, and how that pivoted to something rewarding and, yeah. and fulfilling and uh, humbling, really. Yeah, and uh, it, it's true. Like I always tell people when they share something that's maybe very difficult or ask for prayers, I, I'm like, you don't know me, but thank you for trusting me enough to approach. Mm. Um, we get that a lot and really it makes me so happy when somebody can leave a conversation happier um that we, we'd never know just by being like saint francis of assisi says speak always but when when necessary use words and he's our founder so it's like you know we don't we don't always have to speak words when we're out in public but just by our very witness or is a testimony yeah of who we are who we belong to you were telling me earlier that you knew from a young age that you wanted to, to join the, the religious life and, and become a sister, become a nun. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your discernment process and what that looked like. Okay, so yeah, it was I was telling Corbin at, at World Youth Day in 1993, so I just turned 14, and millions of people there in Mile High Stadium and I can't remember what the park, Cherry Creek Park, I think it was, like literally millions of people and you could feel the enthusiasm and I thought wow like one person has that much effect on a group of kids but I think it's because we know that he is of God um, so that's when I that's when I really felt called to religious life my parents brought us to church my dad's sister is a nun so that was like we saw her all the time but um, it was a personal invitation like just to I think at the end of World Youth Day, Pope John Paul II said, like, go out to the rooftops and announce the good news. I'm like, wow, like, I can do that. But I, I met some consecrated women from Raven Christie, and just the joy and fulfillment that they had, I was like, I want that. So from 14 on, um, and then I continued to stay in touch with them throughout my high school years, and it was just that desire just didn't leave. It didn't go away because... Sometimes you're hoping it will, because giving your life to Christ sometimes is hard, it's demanding, but it's one of the most beautiful things, and I can absolutely say that being, I mean, I've really <laughs> lived the vows since 1997, so that's a long time, in our community for 21 years, but um, it's so fulfilling, it's so freeing, because God has fulfilled every desire that I have, that I dream that will happen, and like a friend of mine asked me several years ago, how can you be happy or fulfilled without the sexual pleasure? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like you don't understand. Love is so much deeper than that. And Christ has totally conquered my heart and he conquers our hearts every day if we let him. So it's, I would, I would say I wouldn't trade this for the world. I would go back and have those struggles again if I had to, but um, because when you love, you'll do things again and again and again uh, I think to make Christ the center of their lives and that means taking time for silence taking time just to be in the Lord's presence if you can't go to the chapel just like sometimes it's helpful just to use an image but and I think to allow Christ to love us in the way that he chooses to love us because 
he's, he, he manifests his love in so many ways. So I think it's just to be completely open to receive his love. There's a song called Belovedness, and it's, it's, it says in there, um, my love for you, talking about God, is fierce and unending. Like, his, his love for us is so fierce. So if we, can, if we can remember how much we're loved, no matter what we've done, his love is so much greater than that. And, yeah, just to know that we are to be conduits of his love and mercy to those that we meet.